And China, I think we can safely say, is perhaps the biggest foreign policy challenge that this country will face in the 21st century. There's positive and there's negative elements, of course, but it's a, a challenge which has been complicated for some time. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with every prime minister since Trudeau through Prime Minister Stephen Harper on China policy issues. I've read the products produced by the organization that Mr. Boisvert used to work for and its predecessor, the S&P Security Service. Um, I don't think I'm naive about China, but it's a complex formula. And my fear is if we deal with the China exclusively through the security dimension, you're going to end up with a very lopsided or warped overall policy. It's a complex multi-challenge, multi-opportunity for this country. China, of course, has returned to its status, its normal status as a great power. Um, it had been that, it's been the case for several thousand years, and until about 150 years ago, it what was the case. People are now getting used to the idea that China is it's large and it's powerful economically, politically, and even militarily. That is the historical norm. It's now solidly in the second place globally in economic terms, and it's on its way gradually perhaps to the first status. It's not automatic and it won't necessarily happen in five years, but certainly if we project current trends that will arrive sometime in the course of the next decade. I'm not suggesting that uh, we, um, in, the, in the case of China, that we have to create special rules, but we, there, China is a complex reality and I'm fearful that if we simply look at it for the security dimension, um, we will miss the other opportunities as well as the potential risks. Um, it certainly has an authoritative political system, that's the fact. But it can no longer be said to have a really a Marxist economy in any sense. Um, yes, the state sector is large. It's been largely reformed. But let's look at the percentage of the GDP which is in private hands. Japan, 37%. These are from the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. This is not Chinese figures. US, 38.9%. Canada, 39.7. France, 52%. China, 20.8%. So the dramatic character of China is really not the fact that it has state enterprises, which still play a strategic role in certain sectors, energy being one, of course, which is relevant to the Sino case. The reality is that China is largely, and the genius of what happened in the Chinese economic miracle was the growth of the private sector. I had the good fortune early in my career on three occasions to meet Deng Xiaoping, who was the architect, always with Canadian prime ministers. He certainly didn't receive me. Um, and um, uh, that, in effect, disillusionment of the Chinese party elite with the failures of the uh, Chinese economic system allowed Deng and his uh, cohort to, in effect, turn the Chinese economy 90 degrees in a different direction. So we now have a very mixed economy with a smaller percentage in private hands, as in the case here in Canada. So when we think about China, we can't just think about SOEs. The reality is the majority of the economy is in private hands. And while there is a wave of SOE investment moving abroad, there's a far larger wave of private investment that will be coming our way, which perhaps will pose fewer challenges to us. By as early as 2014, we may have a majority of, uh, of a larger volume of Chinese investment departing China and arriving abroad than is the case until now. Let's keep in mind that from the early 1980s, or from 1978, from the opening of the Chinese economy until now, there's been massive flows of Western currency investment into China, $50 billion a year on average um, in the last decade, and that's not diminishing. It's not as if people are stopping investing in, in China. It's simply that there's now a return wave. They've been receiving our, our, our investment, now a much uh, a rapidly growing wave of Chinese investment coming the other direction. That, that is the norm with which we'll have to deal with. And I think we need to keep the Sihanouk uh, arrangement within that broader, within that broader perspective. It certainly is true that some of the sectors within China are almost entirely or largely in the hands of, of the state. That includes energy, telecoms, uh, railways, and education. But those four sectors were highlighted by Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, who is a reformer within the current context in China, as areas that would be open to private investment. Um, just yesterday, the National uh, Development Reform Commission, which is a sort of super ministry that guides the Chinese economy, announced that the third west to east gas transmission line would be privately built. It's sort of inconceivable to me when I think back to my early days working in China that um, a sector like energy would actually, a pipeline would be built by private Chinese capital within China. Now my prediction is they'll build it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I know that's a sensitive issue in this country. I think that we, Chinese probably build too quickly. They don't consult sufficiently with 
the people who are living where these pipelines would pass, et cetera, we are on the other extreme. 30 years on, we still don't have a McKenzie gas pipeline. The economic vi vi viability of that whole thing is gone. Um, the Chinese are also um, going to allow a private railway to bring coal from Inner Mongolia to central China. Again, uh, the railway, when I first went to China, there were more people working for Chinese railways, railway than there were Canadians. Um, and that idea that now private capital will do that is extraordinary. But they are also tapping into this. Chinese save prodigiously on an individual basis. They save over 50% of their income, which I could manage that. And that is, of course, where a lot of this capital comes. It goes, then flows into banks that pay very little interest and is then available to, for investment, including by, by state enterprises. We need hundreds of billions of dollars to develop this country. We're small tribe of some 30 million people. It's about a third of the population of Shandong province with half a continent. We've been net borrowers from abroad uh, through, throughout Canadian history. What's complicated now for us, though, is that for the first time in our history, a dominant economic player is not going to be a country that has a very similar cultural or political basis of our own. Even going back to colonial times, be it France, Britain, United States, these have all been countries with whom we've been very comfortable, shared institutions, shared culture, shared language even for that matter. Now for the first time in our national history, we're going to have a change. If you look at another country similar in size to Canada, Australia, they've had a very different path. Early in the 20th, 20th century, their primary uh, partner was Great Britain, then it was the United States, then it was Japan, now it's China. So they've actually been much more, had to be much more nimble in preserving Australian uh, prosperity. They now have China accounts for some 30% of their trade. Last time I walked down the streets of Sydney, even though you meet lots of Chinese business people, even more Chinese students, I didn't feel that their fundamental institutions had been compromised by the fact that this included Chinese investment, which it does, and that includes investment from uh, state enterprises. Now, I greatly respect, and we're going to hear from uh, one of our American cousins very soon, I, I, I do respect U.S. concerns about uh, Chinese investment, of course, in this white-hot um, political environment of a U.S. campaign, and I greatly enjoyed the debate last night, extraordinary. Um, I don't think a Chinese firm could invest in a hot dog stand mm -hmm. in Chicago and get away with it. It would be seen as somehow subversive or dangerous. But the reality, of course, is that, um, yes, there is competition between the United States and China, but there's also tremendous collaboration. These economies are very much intertwined. Sometimes I think you could almost step on the container ships uh, between, say, Seattle and Shanghai. It's a, it's a huge relationship and hugely important. Sometimes when we've tried to maintain a separate China policy, we've faced strong opposition from Washington. That was the case when the conservative government tried to sell, sold wheat in the 1960s in the face of U.S. opposition. We were playing around with the idea of recognizing China and being actively discouraged by Washington until we suddenly discovered that the U.S. itself, President Nixon and and uh, his secretary, security advisor Kissinger, were rapidly moving towards a, a, some sort of a detente or entente with China, and we established relations in 1970. Um, more recently, I mean, actually in the near future, whether it's re-elected President Obama or um, uh, President Romney, I'm sure that they will be visiting China. The normal pattern for the last several administrations in the United States has been to campaign against China to be somewhat reticent of, US, of Chinese policies for about the first year of the administration, then to recognize, whoops, it's very difficult to get much done in the world in an economic terms or in political terms in particular areas without some, at least, dialogue with China and some trade-offs. And of course, these are tough trade-offs. It doesn't mean that US and China have, have similar approaches, nor does Canada and China necessarily. But the idea that you can run a policy oblivious to China or one which is focused only on national security threats, to me, is not sustainable. Um, before we beat ourselves up too much about the idea of Chinese investment in the energy sector, um, let's also consider that China is also present in the United States, including in energy. And um, just a couple examples, and these are, of course, uh, Chinese state enterprises. Sihanouk uh, owns a good portion of Chesapeake Energy, also part of the Nibiru play in uh, Colorado. Um, Sinopec uh, has investments with Devon Petroleum in Ohio, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Michigan. These are Chinese state enterprises uh, that have investments, and these will increase. Of course, they're in shale plays, and of course, that's important to China. They want the technology. It's true. I'd like to see Albertan firms sell the technology to China and not for them to get it through some other means. But there's a tremendous future for shale gas in, 
in Sichuan and in other parts of China, it's geologically complex, it's poorly understood. They need that expertise. And of course, they're going to get it one way or the other. Shell Oil, for example, is actively working with China in the Sichuan Basin, um, uh, in effect, uh, seeing the future and the, and the importance of shale gas in China. Uh, they'll be, Shell will be providing technology to them. This is technology they're going to get one way or the other. I'd like to buy it, them to buy it from us and for us uh, to be partners. Now, yes, we have economic interests there, and yes, there are security interests, and there are strategic interests that need to play, and we're going to hear from the, from the human rights considerations, and, and those are important as well. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can be concerned about uh, security interests, and we can promote our economic interests in a, in a mature and, and multifaceted way. I prefer, though, the vision, and keep in mind that Canadian firms are in the leadership in, in investing abroad. We own petroleum resources and natural resources all around the world. I think Canadian firms actually rank number one in the number of individual firms in terms of exploration, Africa, Asia, including China. And I prefer the vision of a, of a Canada which is actively going abroad, investing abroad with an open economy that has a hope of sustaining our prosperity. And in terms of sustaining our prosperity, let's also remember that yes, our banking system helped us through the recession, uh, that um, we have a prudently run economy, but starting in 07, 2007, the largest single piece of growth in the global economy has come from China. Um, without Chinese demand for commodities, um, our prosperity would be very much compromised. And I personally believe that's actually been the single biggest factor in preserving the vitality of the Canadian economy is that incremental Chinese demand. It's a complex formula. There are negatives, there are positives, but without a multifaceted approach, if it's focused surely on, on human rights and security, you'll have an unbalanced China, Chinese relationship. Thank you.